Friday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Kathy Park in for Savannah Sellers. Right now in Morning News Now, a deadly sweep. At least seven people are dead in Alabama and other parts of the South after a string of possible tornadoes ripped through the region, leaving behind widespread damage. The storm is wiping out homes, downing power lines, and leaving significant debris in several towns. Just out of nowhere, I heard a sound I never heard before. It sounded like a freight train come through here. And the wind picked up so strong, I, I had to jump out and I ran out because everything was shaking. We've got the latest on conditions on the ground there this morning as emergency crews and communities begin to survey the damage. Also under investigation, U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland names a special counsel to look into the handling of classified documents found in President Biden's Delaware home and an office he used after serving as vice president. The investigation focusing on serious questions. Were any federal laws violated? And now lawmakers on both sides are pressing for answers over the timing and nature of the search for these documents as Republicans call for a congressional investigation. And remembering Lisa Marie, Lisa Marie Presley, the only child of Elvis Presley, is dead at 54 after going into cardiac arrest and being rushed to the hospital yesterday. A look back at her life in the spotlight. And in and outward bound, fast food lovers rejoice. The West Coast burger chain in and out known for its double double and animal fries, just announced it's heading east and it could be coming to a city near you. We've got the chain's pick for its first location east of the Mississippi. Yeah, a lot of burger fans are pretty excited about we that. We both know that. We both lived out west, and we know if you haven't gone before, just Google secret menu. There's things that are not delicious the menu that you can that you can order. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, we begin with those uh, latest on those devastating southern storms from Kentucky to the Gulf Coast. This morning, thousands of people are waking up in the dark after tornadoes ripped through homes, toppled trees, and left a trail of destruction in their wake. At least seven people have been killed, including a five-year-old boy in Butts County, Georgia. The six other deaths were reported in Alabama, which face a brunt of these storms. Take a look at this video. You can see a funnel cloud forming in the sky just northwest of Montgomery. Farther south near Mobile, neighbors in one community say they didn't have much time to react before the twister hit. In Selma, a tornado lifted debris as high as 16,000 feet into the air. The mayor there says that the storms caused significant damage. And that is where our team coverage begins with NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander. Well, guys, good morning to you. This is just a stunning look right now at downtown Selma, Alabama. I mean, if you look behind me, you see this debris pile, but really our captures can our cameras can't even barely capture how big it is. Over here, you can see an entire wall of a building has just been ripped off. Even when we were driving in this morning, we had to be rerouted because there were power poles in the road. There were uh, pieces, there were stoplights out. Clearly, this area has no power. This is just one part of Alabama, really one part of the South that was hit so hard by these brutal storms. Already reports of more than three dozen tornadoes across the South, seven deaths, and officials tell us that as they continue to go through piles like these, as they continue to look through the debris, there is concern that that death toll could possibly rise today. Now, this is also notable because, as you know, we're in the middle of January. This is in the middle of winter. We're going to spend the day talking to people, finding out how they were able to respond to this. But again, just a devastating uh, tragedy. And also those images of the tornado that came through here, certainly unbelievable, very strong. And you can see that by the damage here, guys. Alexander Blaine, thank you so much. For more on this, we are now joined by Ernie Baggett. He is the Emergency Management Agency Director of Hard Hit Ataga County. Ernie, thank you so much for joining us. We'll note you're in your car right now, but you're not driving. You're in a safe position. This is a county that is really located between Selma, where we just saw Blaine, and Montgomery. What's the situation like in your county this morning? Well, we're we're going back out this morning. That's where I'm headed to now. We're uh, we're starting our search back up again uh, this morning to make sure that we have everyone accounted for. Um, we have about, we're thinking right now, about 40 homes that have either been completely destroyed or have been damaged to a point where no one can stay in them anymore. So uh, we're, we're trying to get out there, get some assessments on that, and uh, and do the those searches, those final searches, and make sure that we haven't missed anything or anyone. 
Of the seven deaths reported from these storms so far in the south, at least six of them are actually in your county. You say you're going back out there this morning as the lights come on, as the sun rises. Are you worried there could be more, or do you feel and hope everyone's been accounted for? Well, we certainly hope that, that there is no more, but uh, we just don't have that account accountability piece that we need right now to, to make us feel comfortable with it normally when something like this would happen you know you can speak to the neighbors and ask if uh those if the people were home next door or if they if those homes were occupied we've not had that opportunity because the residents of those areas have not been able to get back in there so we're hoping today to be able to make contact and find out and then just go back through if if there are any concerned areas and make sure that we haven't missed anything. Some of the videos that we have seen from Alabama and from other parts of the South have just been devastating. Paint a picture for us. What is it you have seen driving around throughout the night? Have you seen anything like this before in your county? I haven't, no. Uh, We've got about a 20 mile track is what we're thinking right now. The storm that hit us was the same one that hit Selma. Uh, the weather service did really good. We were able to track it all the way through. They warned ahead of time. Uh, so we were able to watch that as it moved through, but that was the same storm there. Uh, again, it tracked across our county and very much like what you see the pictures in Selma and everywhere else, that's what we're seeing. It's, it's uh, complete devastation there's some a couple of our county roads that there's only one or two homes left that may be livable you say people were warned ahead of time how were people warned how much notice did they get uh, i don't know the exact number on the notice i know that we were the weather service was was uh, tracking this particular storm as it moved through Selma. They warned it in Selma. They they give us a heads up that it would be potentially moving into our county. They warned it that way. Uh, so the weather radios were working just as they should. Uh, we were using the weather sirens, which are you know really intended for outdoor use. But uh, that, along with our local uh, meteorologists and news channels, they were really uh, on top of it yesterday. All right, Ernie Baggett with Otaga County. Thank you so much for taking some time to join us this morning. We are thinking of your community. Thank you. And we want to continue our coverage with the severe conditions across the southeast. Yeah, meteorologist Michelle Grossman is in for Angie this morning and has the latest. Hey, Michelle. Hey there, guys. Great to see you. And yeah, the Sphere Protection Center put out this forecast early yesterday, even the day before. They made it uh, increase it to enhanced risk early yesterday morning. So that was out. The information was out. We had 35 uh, tornado reports. It doesn't mean we had 35 tornadoes. The National Weather Service has to get in there, survey the damage. As Ernie mentioned, one tornado went 20 miles. Tornadoes can go hundreds of miles. So they're going to get in there and determine just how many, just how big it was. A lot of times you can determine maybe the the size of the storm by how far the debris goes aloft into the air. And we have seen debris going pretty high. So maybe even an EF3, EF, EF4 tornado. That is a strong tornado, especially in January. But we will certainly keep you posted on that. That was a lot of tornado reports yesterday. It was a busy, active day. We were seeing these storms as early as our shows yesterday, lasting throughout the afternoon into the evening hours. So it was an all-day event. And just another note, this is the same storm that came through the Pacific on Monday, it tracked cross country by Thursday, causing these, this severe weather. The good news is we're waking up this morning to just plain rain. It is heavy at times in some spots, and you can see that cold front is nearly off the coast. We have the tail end in the portions of Florida. Then we have some cold air working on the backside. That's bringing some snow in parts of the Northeast. Otherwise, we're not looking at lightning. We're not looking at severe weather this morning. We're starting to see it transitioning into a cold weather type event. So as we zoom in a little closer here, where you see those yellows, the reds, the oranges, that's where we're seeing the heaviest rain falling. So we're certainly seeing some heavy rain falling still in portions of the Northeast, especially in upstate New York, into portions of New England. Seeing the blue also, we could see up to a foot of snow in the far north portions of Maine, also a couple inches along the Great Lakes. That's going to be the story throughout the day. So here's your winter alerts. We do have them up along the Appalachians, along the Great Lakes, into portions of Maine as well. We have a flood watch too. So 9 million people impacted by these alerts this morning. 
And we're going to see quite a bit of snow in some spots. This is good news for the snow lovers. We're snow deprived in the northeast. So portions of Maine and the Great Lakes, we're going to see additional snowfall there. We're going to see the temperatures dropping as well. We're already seeing that in, temp in uh, the southeast Atlanta, 48 degrees. That's six degrees below normal. That's the forecast for today. 55 in Tallahassee. Still warm in Philadelphia early on. Norfolk too, 59. But notice what happens. That cold front completely clears the coast. And by tomorrow, we're back to near average temperatures. Uh, D.C., 41 degrees. That's three degrees below average. And then we're going to rebound really nicely next week by Monday in D.C., back into the 50s, into the mid-40s in New York City. So that is the East Coast. Also watching the West Coast, we have a trio of storms. One today, one tomorrow, one on Sunday. Tomorrow's going to be a powerful one. We're looking at the chance for very heavy rain once again. Some heavy mountain snow, feet of snow once again. And we could see up to four or five inches of rain in some spots. So as a result, 15 million people are impacted in the state of California. We're concerned about landslides. We're concerned about mudslides. And we're concerned about washed out roadways once again. So the concern for California is coming back. Let's end it here because we have so many burn scar areas from the wildfire season. And this is why we're concerned about the landfalls. We really just don't have that vegetation that's going to soak up that water. It's going to bring that debris field down. And we're going to be watching this very closely all weekend long. Back to you guys. Yeah, a lot of severe weather across the country. Michelle, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now to Washington and the latest on the investigation into classified marked documents connected to President Biden that have now been found in two different locations. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland appointed a special counsel to review the classified material found in Biden's Delaware home and a Washington office he used after leaving the Obama White House. The first batch of documents were found last November before the midterm election, but the discovery wasn't made public until this week. Those documents are under review by the Justice Department. Garland discussed the appointment yesterday with reporters. I signed an order appointing Robert Herr a special counsel for the matter I've just described. The document authorizes him to investigate whether any person or entity violated the law in connection with this matter. And for the latest, let's bring in NBC News correspondent Julia Ainsley and White House correspondent Carol Lee. Good morning to you both. Carol, uh, let's start with you. The president spoke about the documents yesterday, fielded a lot of questions from reporters. What do we know about them and, and what did he say? Well, what we know so far is actually very little. We know where they were found. We know there were three different occasions in which the president's legal team discovered these documents. We, the White House Counsel's Office says that there's a small number of documents that were found at the president's home in Wilmington, Delaware. We know from our own reporting that the documents that were found on November 2nd at the president's office that he had after he left the vice presidency, that there were fewer than a dozen documents there. And now we're learning that one of the documents at that office that was found is labeled TSSCI. So that's a very high classification. The others were told were not as high of a classification. As for what the president has said about this, when he was asked about this yesterday, he continued to say that his White House and his team will fully cooperate. Take a listen. They discovered a small number of documents of classified markings and storage areas and file cabinets in my home and my in my, my my personal library. This was done in the case of the Biden Penn and th this was done in the case of the Biden Penn Center. The Department of Justice was immediately as was done. The Department of Justice was immediately uh, uh, no notified and uh, the lawyers arranged for the Department of Justice to take possession of the document. Now, the president continues to say that he takes classified information very seriously. At the same time, we've seen him sort of downplay this. He said, you know, yes, these documents were locked in a, in a garage next to a Corvette, but his Corvette at his home in Wilmington, but it's not like they were out there in the street. And as for the president's legal team, we've heard from the White House counsel's office after that special counsel was named by the Justice Department that this is something that these documents wound up with in these boxes that the president took after he left the Obama administration by mistake. And Julia, the other big headline yesterday was the appointment of this new special counsel, Robert Herr, a former U.S. attorney for Maryland. So what more do we know about him and his selection? <laughs> 
That's right. Robert Hur was the U.S. attorney in Maryland under the Trump administration. He was a Trump pick. He served from 2018 until February 2021, just as President Biden was coming into office. I think that's important context here because Merrick Garland and the appointment of a special counsel wants to show he's not picking one of his own here. Robert Hur has a long reputation. He also served as number two to Rod Rosenstein when he was deputy attorney general when he was overseeing special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation because then Attorney General Jeff Sessions had recused himself. And this appointment is really for Garland to show independence here. He also says it's because the U.S. attorney in the Northern District of Illinois, John Lausch, has, is now moving on to the private sector. He had previously been overseeing the preliminary investigation into these documents. But in an effort to show the independence of this investigation as well as the independence of the investigation into Trump's handling of classified documents, he thinks a special counsel appointment is necessary. Necessary. Here's the reasons he gave yesterday. Take a listen. This appointment underscores for the public the department's commitment to both independence and accountability in particularly sensitive matters and to making decisions indisputably guided only by the facts and the law. So you can see there, there is a lot of questions about is the appointment of a special counsel necessarily meaning that this investigation has, go has gone up and is more serious. There's so much we don't know about these documents or what might be in them. But there, this, the attorney general is clearly saying the reason for this is independence. We're not learning a whole lot about what uh, U.S. Attorney Lausch might have told Merrick Garland that prompted the appointment of Robert Herr. And Carol, obviously the spotlight is on these documents. Uh, a special counsel investigation will no longer, uh, will no doubt be a distraction for the White House. How is the administration preparing to handle this while still trying to move forward with the president's agenda? Yeah, that's a great point. It's a huge distraction for this White House. This is a president that's, by all accounts, getting ready to announce that he's running for re-election and to launch a 2024 campaign. And this be is a huge political headache for them. Also, you know, notable that there are aides to the president who worked for him as vice president in those closing weeks of his vice presidency who are likely to be interviewed as part of this investigation. We know from our own reporting, Mayor Mike Memoli, that there have already been Biden aides who were interviewed in this preliminary review that was done of these documents, including an executive uh, assistant to the president who was that uh, when he was vice president, who works at the Pentagon. There are a number of officials in the White House who also worked for him as vice president. And so this is something that's going to be a big distraction. We now also have this situation where you have the president's only for a declared opponent, former President Donald Trump, who has a special counsel looking into his handling of classified information. And now you have the president who has his own special counsel looking into classified information. And that is a narrative that's really going to be a struggle for the White House to get around. All right. Uh, I'm sure we'll be following this uh, in the days and weeks to come. Carol and Julia, thanks so much. We'll keep following it and dig a little deeper into all this with NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good morning to you. So first of all, tell us a little bit about the role of a special counsel in this uh, in this situation. What exactly is Robert Hur going to be looking for? By now, we are all familiar with special counsels. Yeah. We've had a host of special counsels over the last five years or so. And really, this is going to be an immediate four-point plan. Number one, find out what U.S. Attorney Loesch learned during his investigation. That will be helpful. But then find out what documents were taken, what were their classification. There are reports that some were classified TS, SCI. That's not good for Biden. That's the highest level of classification. But he needs to ascertain the universe of documents and then find out how they got there, because that's critical to determining what responsibility Biden has. And it's the same analysis for Trump and the Mar-a-Lago documents, although there are marked differences, and I'm sure we'll get into those, but at least for the moment, the Biden inquiry is going to be, how did the documents get there? Because right now, it appears that once they were discovered, that the steps were taken to alert the proper authorities. You, you mentioned President Trump. Obviously, there are a lot of comparisons with the documents found at the Mar-a-Lago estate. Um, what would you say are the differences as far as the investigation between uh, a former president and a sitting president? For both uh, Trump and Biden, what, one of the commonalities is that we don't know exactly how the documents got from the White House to each's respective mm -hmm. home. 
But what we do know about the major differences are what happened once the documents were discovered. We've all discussed the market differences between uh, the National Archives going to Trump and saying, we need these documents back, and the Trump team fighting tooth and nail. Whereas with Biden, it appears that once they were discovered, they were turned over. Now, that doesn't affect that there might have been something wrong about how the documents got from the White House to Biden's garage. And I just have to say, probably not a good look for Biden to say something like, hey, they're in my garage. They're, it's not like they're out in the middle of the street. His team has done a good job so far of uh, alerting, following the process, letting the National Archives know, and being forthcoming. Biden's got to be really careful not to make glib remarks about, ah, no biggie, they're in my garage. Because most of us with garages know that the garage is not the most secure facility right. in our home. Now, most of us are Manhattan dwellers. Right. We don't have garages. But those of us that do realize that the garage is not where you put your most valuable item. So not a good look. He should stick with his advisors, who really so far appear to have done everything right. So real quickly, if if the special counsel finds that the law was violated here, what are the potential consequences for the president? There are potential criminal consequences for taking documents from the White House to your home. I mean, people have been prosecuted for this in the past. It's interesting, though, in situations where people immediately alert, hey, I've got these classified documents, I didn't know about it. One of the consequences is often administrative. They revoke that person's security clearance. You can't really do that with the sitting president. So that's an administrative remedy that is simply unavailable. Another interesting philosophical discussion is, what if Biden, and I don't think he'd do this, what if he waved his hand and declassified these documents now? It wouldn't affect that they were classified at the time, but it really would practically affect the investigation. It's a hypothetical that probably will never come to fruition. Were Trump in the White House, that would not be a hypothetical. He would do it. As he said he did with the documents in Mar-a-Lago, so he there you go. Benedicted them or All whatever right. it is. <laughs> All right, Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's turn our attention now to Capitol Hill, where House Republicans are cranking up the pressure on fellow Congressman George Santos. Yeah, more Republicans are now calling for Santos to resign after the newly elected representative admitted to fabricating parts of his background in the lead up to the 2022 midterms. For more on this, we are joined by NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin and NBC News correspondent George Solis, who's in Santos's district on Long Island, New York. Julie, uh, let's start with you. Who are the latest folks to call for Santos to step down? And what are they saying? Yeah, look, well, I think it's notable that after yesterday, all House freshman Republican members have now called on Santos to resign. Remember, they are part of the same freshman class. Many of them actually were able to flip their districts, including Santos. And I think it's notable for what they had to say and why they think Santos should resign and it's time. Take a listen to what two of them had to say, and we'll talk about it more on the other side. He's lost the confidence of, of people in his own community. So, I, you know, I think he needs to seriously consider whether or not he can actually do his job effectively. And right now, it's pretty clear he can't. I don't think there's any way he could possibly uh, perform his duty. Uh, but the man's got to be honest with himself and his constituents. And uh, it's just clear to me that uh, he can't, 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 can't do his job. Now, that was Congressman Molinaro. You saw at the end there in the beginning, that was Congressman Lawler. He actually ended up releasing a statement later in the night saying it is time for him to resign. And this comes after the Nassau County Republicans, the local Republican Party that actually helped Santos get to this place. They forcefully called on Santos to resign, saying that he lied and fabricated uh, everything about him and has disgraced his voters. And George, so far, uh, Santos has refused to resign. Has his position changed at all in light of all these calls from his fellow Republicans to do so? Yeah, good morning, Kathy. You'd be surprised, right? You would think that after hearing all of that from members on the Hill, he would actually take those steps to resign. But he is digging his heels, saying he has no plans to resign. And as he's been on the Hill, he's been avoiding questions about some of those fabrications and falsehoods, and the, including some about his campaign finances. But yesterday, NBC News actually was able to get Santos really quickly on an elevator where he said he would resign if 142 people told him to do so. Of course, he later clarified that point on Steve Bannon's war room. Take a listen. 
I came here to serve the people, not politicians and party leaders, and uh, and I'm going to do just that. And I've been doing just that throughout this entire first two weeks, whether it was voting for the speaker or whether it's been the last week where we've been working on legislation in my office. So, you know, I, I wish well all of their opinions, but I was elected by 142,000 people. Until those same 142,000 people tell me they don't want me, uh, we'll find out in two years. Yeah, and during that interview, Matt Gates, who was there interviewing uh, Santos, asked him, all right, let's talk about some of those campaign finances. Where do they come from? And you'll notice he actually didn't answer the question, just saying, I'll tell you where it didn't come from. It didn't come from Ukraine, didn't come from China. So, again, there's certain things that he is excluding, which is, again, shaking the confidence of some of his constituents here in Nassau County. Yeah, Guys. so, George, as we heard right there, he appears to be putting his fate in the hands of the 142,000 people who voted for him. How are they reacting to all of this where you are? Yeah, Joe, it's a mixed bag. You have people who are his supporters who are going to say, hey, listen, what we've heard, that's fine. We want him to do his time in Congress. We want him to see what he'll, what he'll do for us. But then you have others, including members of the GOP, as you heard Julie mention, the chairman of the GOP here in Nassau County, Joe G. Cairo, saying, you are not going to be an effective leader. It is time for you to step down. And, of course, we are going to spend the day here in Nassau County talking to more constituents and getting more reaction to see if people here do, in fact, want him to stay or go. It should be an interesting turnout, to say the least. Guys? And, Julie, going back to you, do we know if Santos uh, is likely to face the Ethics Committee? And, and what's leadership saying right now? Well, that's the interesting thing here because Republican leadership is actually saying, give him a chance. Let's, you know, the people elected him, let's see what he's going to do. He's part of the GOP conference. He was sworn in last week. And the reality here is that McCarthy, the speaker, needs his vote. And Santos supported McCarthy for his speakership. So, look, he is facing the Ethics Committee. That's because House Democrats from New York actually filed a complaint. So the Ethics Committee is currently looking into him. And McCarthy said as much. Uh, but he also said he'll be held accountable exactly as anybody else in his body would. Uh, but we will let that investigation play out. And I should know that other uh, members of McCarthy's leadership, including Elise Stefanik from New York, actually, said Santos should not resign and he should serve his time because he was elected. But I think bottom line here, it all comes down to the votes McCarthy has with that slim majority. He was able to win in November. Really, every vote here counts. And Santos coming uh, from a plus eight Biden district would be a dangerous one to lose. All right, Julie Sirk and George Solis, thanks so much. Sad news overnight. Lisa Marie Presley, the daughter of rock and roll legend Elvis Presley, has passed away. Her mother, Priscilla, made the announcement in a statement saying the family is, quote, shocked and devastated by the tragic death of their beloved Lisa Marie. Hours before her death, Priscilla confirmed her daughter had been rushed to the hospital. Paramedics were sent to a home in Calabasas, California, earlier that morning after receiving calls that a woman was not breathing. The news came just two days after Lisa Marie attended the Golden Globe Awards, where she celebrated Austin Butler's win for portraying her father in the movie Elvis. Lisa Marie Presley was 54 years old. And straight ahead, an alarming warning about climate change. We'll take a look at what a new report is saying and where we stand. Also this morning, COVID cases in China are spiking ahead of the country's Lunar New Year celebration. So could this create an even bigger surge? We're going to tell you what officials there are saying. It's coming up next on Morning News Now. As the U.S. continues to deal with the fallout from a series of natural disasters, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has released an alarming new report about the state of climate change. The organization ranked 2022 as Earth's sixth warmest year on record with a 1.5 degree Fahrenheit increase. To help break down this report, let's bring in Brenda Ekwersel. She is a senior climate scientist for the Union of Concerned Scientists. Brenda, good morning to you. This is very uh, timely given what's happening right now in the southeast. Uh, but the 10 warmest years on record have all occurred since 2010. This year was no different. What do these trends show you? And to you, what stood out in this year's report? What's really important is that fact that you said that the last nine years are among the 10 hottest since they've been keeping records in the late 1880s. So this tells you that we are really in a warming world. And one of the aspects of the report that is so important is that there was another report released by NOAA just 
uh, recently about the extreme weather events of 2021. You may remember that the, the Japan Olympics in the summertime were just extremely hot and humid for the athletes. And in that report, they were saying that that marine heat wave that was influencing the weather of Japan at the time of the Olympics was over 40 times more likely because of our human activities that are warming our world. And so the fact that this year is among the nine of the top 10 hottest in the world uh, since 1880 really tells you we're in a new normal. And what would you say, where are we seeing the most severe fallout from climate change right now? One thing we do know, uh, we've been looking at some of the extreme events that people just aren't used to experiencing. Um, for example, Hurricane Irma that hit Florida and the intensity, the rapid intensification of these hurricanes is something that we're finding is really a feature of some of these really powerful storms such as hurricanes. And so it's very hard for weather forecasters to warn people to get out of the way. And that's something at the American Meteorological Society meeting all this week is talking about how can we share the weather on uh, news shows and events and new graphics that will better warn people about the triple threats from such storms. It's not just the wind damage, it's the rain that's more extreme and holding um, more, more intense and the storm surge combining together to create threats to life and property, which we can do better to save lives around the world. And Brenda, we can't forget about the cost to rebuild from these climate disasters. It's, it's quite staggering, $165 billion. So are we investing enough into these programs that will not only help protect against the effects of climate change, but to keep the worst effects of climate change from happening? And if not, what changes would you like to see be made? Uh, it's spot on. The, the best preparedness is actually designing these structures that we know will be around for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. They have to be designed for the climate of the future, but we're still playing catch up with the buildings that we have that were designed in the last century that people are seeking shelter in. And so many changes can be done. There's many jobs that can be uh, deployed and resources deployed to help protect people, plan for future events so we're more resilient and keep the most vulnerable, those are least mobile, uh, those who have, don't have resources to go out and buy food for two weeks that can get through a storm and the power outages, we could do better to improve our electric grid. Mm -hmm. And all around, there's lots of jobs and energy that we can do to make our communities more resilient, which is good news. We, we do have solutions. Yeah, we can all do our part and it all adds up. Brenda Eckwurzel, thank you so much. There is a new warning about the COVID pandemic in China. Concerns are growing over a potential surge of cases in rural areas as people set out to travel for the Lunar New Year holiday. So just how bad is the situation? Last week, Chinese health officials said that nearly 90% of people in one of the country's most populated provinces were infected with COVID. Joining us now to discuss is NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea. Kelly, good morning to you. We know cases in China have skyrocketed since officials rolled back restrictions last month, moved away from their zero COVID policy. Now festivities for the Chinese New Year are set to kick off next week. How worried are people about a huge rise in cases? Well, Chinese officials are really trying to downplay this, Joe, saying that the peak uh, has already happened, that this surge has peaked, that the spread of COVID is both predictable and under control. But as you said, we're now coming close to the Chinese uh, Lunar New Year. Uh, people will be going from cities, uh, spreading out into the country, into more rural areas. China has a large older population with very low vaccination rates. So the concern from international experts is that, in fact, the, the virus is going to spread uh, even more than it has already, uh, and there could be uh, a higher death count. Now, China has, has also said that they have a very low uh, death count since December 7th, saying that only 40 people uh, have died from COVID-related reasons. Uh, but there are a lot of questions about those numbers, Joe. And there is also this question of whether or not as 
that virus spreads within the country, whether a new variant emerges. It's hard to say. Experts are still debating this because so little information is coming out of the country. Joe? Let's talk about those fatality numbers and the questions surrounding them. I mean, many observers fear that China is not being transparent with the rest of the world about the number of COVID fatalities it's reporting. What more do we know about this? Yeah, and there's now new evidence pointing to just that. These satellite pictures from technology company, Colorado-based technology company Maxar, shared with NBC News. And what they appear to show is heightened activity at funeral homes and crematoriums in several cities in China. In one case, at a funeral home just outside Beijing, you can see uh, that a large parking lot uh, has been constructed at another funeral home. It appears that there's much more activity compared to the same time uh, in, in past years. And this is consistent with our reporting from our NBC colleagues on the ground, reporting uh, more activity at funeral homes, reporting uh, people in white hazmat suits bringing a steady stream of, of coffins into a, a funeral home outside Beijing over the course of a week. Uh, and also a report from one funeral home that the wait for a cremation uh, was up to two weeks. Uh, and on top of that, the WHO sort of confirming all of this, saying that they simply don't have enough information from officials in Beijing to get a clear picture of what's happening in the country. Joe. All right, Kelly Kobier. Kelly, thank you so much. To more international headlines now, new developments in the assassination of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavaga joins us with that and other world news. Claudio, good morning. Good morning. Yes, the suspect who last July shot the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe during a campaign speech in Japan has now been formally charged with murder. Tetsuya Yamagami was arrested immediately after the shooting and underwent a six-month mental evaluation. Now prosecutors say he's fit to stand trial. Let's go to Brazil, where on Thursday, the National Artistic Heritage Institute released a report describing the full extent of the damage caused by rioters who rampaged through Congress, the Supreme Court, and the Presidential Palace last Sunday. According to the report, furniture was burned, portraits defaced, sculptures decapitated, ceramics smashed, and carpets were found soaked with water from the building sprinkler systems as well as with urine. And let's come back here in Italy, where anger is brewing over Ireland's proposal to add health warnings on bottles of wine, beer and spirits. Ireland plans to warn drinkers about the health risks associated with alcohol, but Coldiretti, Italy's biggest farmers association, called them terrifying warnings and a direct attack against Italy, which is a major exporter of wine, of course, because the labels could negatively influence consumer choices, guys. Joe, Cathy? Yeah, don't mess with Italy's wine, <laughs> yeah, right? No kidding. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, Claudio, thank you. Coming up, anti-Semitism on the rise. The Anti-Defamation League is reporting an uptick in hostility and prejudice against Jewish people in recent years. What the group is doing to combat these views. We'll have it for you next. We are back with an alarming new study about anti-Semitism in America. The Anti-Defamation League says the number of Americans who believe at least one stereotype or trope about Jewish people has doubled in just three years. And it comes as more Jewish people report anti-Semitic attacks and harassment along with political rhetoric. Let's bring in Jonathan Green, Greenblatt, who for more on this, he is the CEO and National Director of the Anti-Defamation League. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining us this morning. I mean, this report focused on sentiments toward Jewish stereotypes stereotype, something that I understand was not included in previous studies. So tell us why it was important to have this nuance for this report, and what did you learn? Well, the ADL is the oldest anti-hate organization in America. We've been studying anti-Semitism, running these kind of sentiment analyses since the 1960s. And what we learned in this latest study is really quite shocking. So in, in whole, we found that 20% of the overall population holds strongly held anti-Semitic beliefs, 20%. That's nearly double what we saw when we last did this type of survey in 2019. We saw a high correlation between people who hate Jewish, between uh, recipients who hate Jewish people 
and those who hate the Jewish state. So a nuance that we looked at here that we hadn't before is how do those tie together? And we found a stunning stat that 17% of Americans are uncomfortable spending time with a person who is supportive of Israel. 40% think the Jewish state is treating the Palestinians like the way the Nazis treated the Jews during the systematic annihilation of the Holocaust. I mean, it's stunning. But more than anything, there are only 7 million Jews in the United States. And to think that 20% of the population, well over 50 million people, possess strongly held anti-Semitic beliefs, that's scary. But it does clarify and help us to understand that in a moment when we have celebrities, entertainers, athletes, elected officials, political candidates taking shots at Jews, weaponizing anti-Semitism, you know, in their public speech, it starts to see the impact that this has on ordinary people around the country. Uh, Jonathan, the ADL also focused on the sentiments of different generations. What did you find? Yeah. Any surprises? Yes, that's a great question. Some very surprising data. We often think that the next generation is more tolerant, more accepting than older generations. And while generally that may be true, in fact, we see anti-Semitism going up among younger people. Higher degrees of anti-Semitism, prejudice against Jewish people, higher degrees of negative sentiment against the Jewish state. I mean, that's that really surprised us and underscores why we need to think differently about our interventions to address this issue. So like, for example, DEI programs and trainings, which are so popular on college campuses and in workplaces, often simply don't address anti-Semitism. That needs to change. Anti-Semitism should be as unacceptable as anti-black racism, anti-AAPI hate, homophobia. We need to make sure that happens. I think we also need to look at anti-bias, anti-hate education in middle schools and high schools and to make sure, again, that all people, regardless of how they pray or where they're from or who they love, they all need to be treated equally and so we need to re-examine our education programs to make sure Jews are included. So important to have these conversations. Jonathan Greenblatt, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And coming up, you've probably heard of dry January with people cutting out alcohol this month. Well, apparently it's the perfect time to go vegan, too. We're going to tell you about Veganuary and all of its health benefits. You're watching Morning News now. Financial headlines now after the holiday travel meltdown. Southwest CEO has plans to address operations concerns. CNBC's Pippa Stevens joins us now for this and more money news. Good morning, Pippa. Good morning. Well, Southwest Airlines' CEO says all options are on the table to ensure last month's operations meltdown doesn't happen again. Southwest has hired an outside consulting firm to investigate the disruption that canceled thousands of flights and stranded passengers over the Christmas holiday weekend. Southwest has also adopted some interim measures, including a software update to automate the scheduling system for flight crews. Meantime, HBO Max is raising the price of its ad-free version for the first time since the streaming service launched in 2020. The monthly subscription is going up by $1 to $15.99. HBO Max is facing pressure from slowing user growth and competition from larger rivals Netflix and Disney+, Plus, which both raised prices for some of their plans last year. And the IRS will start accepting and processing tax returns on January 23rd. The filing deadline for most people to submit their 2022 returns, ask for an extension and pay money owed is April 18th. The normal filing date of April 15th falls on a weekend and the District of Columbia's Emancipation Day holiday is on the 17th. The IRS says taxpayers should expect a smoother filing season this year. The agency has added 5,000 customer service representatives and continues to chip away at the backlog of unprocessed returns from last year. You know, as someone who only ever files on the very last day, I can't believe <laughs> there are actual people <laughs> that file in January. Yeah. yeah, I got my email from my account the other day, and I'm like, am I going to get ahead of the curve this year? No, no. Yeah, yeah. not a chance. Right. Thanks, Pip. Appreciate it. All right, well, now this month, many of us are saying bye-bye to burgers and switching to salad as part of the phenomenon known as Veganuary. Yeah, that is right. It is the growing movement to go vegan for the month of January, cutting out all foods in your diet that come 
from animals. Participants include celebrities like Billie Eilish, who has been encouraging her fans to consider both the health and environmental benefits of a plant-based diet. Joining us now for some expert tips on giving it a try is author, public health nutritionist, and longtime vegan, Tracy McWhorter. Good morning, Tracy. Happy Friday. Uh, so I understand Good. that you've been a, a vegan for about 36 years now. So what made you change your diet? And, and why do you think more people are jumping on board to do this? Yes, good morning, Joe and Kathy. Thanks for having me. I have been vegan for 36 years, and my mother planted the earliest seed back in 1960, 1960s. And um, we were health conscious omnivores. We ate meat and dairy, but we didn't have junk food, sugar. We cooked from scratch most days. We always had vegetables, and I hated it. Um, but when I was a sophomore at Amherst College, Dick Gregory gave a lecture to our campus about why we should eat plant-based foods and all of the connections to justice, to um, health, to the uh, even the climate back then. And so that really uh, piqued my interest because I was already familiar with eating healthy food. So yes, it's been 36 years and I've been teaching people how to do it for about 34 years. You hated vegetables as a kid and look at you now so that means there is hope for everyone i mean talk to Absolutely. us a little bit about the health benefits that come with a vegan diet sure so we know that eating whole plant-based foods in particular fruits vegetables whole grains beans and nuts as ingredients in delicious meals that's the healthiest way to eat and it can reduce the risk of our major chronic diseases like uh, certain cancers, heart disease, stroke, diabetes by up to 80% or more. So those are the primary benefits and we want more people to eat these ingredients because it can greatly help to increase their quality of life and their longevity. Um, now, Tracy, vegan diets for some can be a little overwhelming, right? Especially for a beginner like myself who might be giving up their favorite foods. Do you have any good tips uh, for people just trying out Veganuary for the first time? Um, because I think, you know, th this might be a misconception, but I feel like I'm going to be pretty hungry if I don't have some sort of protein, some sort of meat in my diet. Well, that is a common misconception, and I want to kind of dispel that right now. There, there's lots of delicious food to eat. Follow your favorite vegan influencers. Get their recipes online, their cookbooks. Of course, 10 Million Black Vegan Women um, is one of them. Uh, Veganuary itself is one of them. And you want to have ease and grace with yourself and focus on what you can do that's easy. So if you like um, stir fries, if you like pastas, if you like burgers, if you like wraps, veganize those and start there because those things are easy for you. You already make them and you can veganize them. So take a stir fry, for example. If you use chicken and colorful vegetables and grains, just swap out chickpeas, mushrooms, black beans, red beans, nuts, cashews, almonds. That's an easy thing to do. If you like pasta dishes, make your pasta dishes the normal way that you would. Just add fresh fruits and vegetables like tomatoes and zucchini and squash and sweet Sweet potatoes, you can add tofu, you can add beans, you can add nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, the same with wraps, the same with salads, and then treat yourself yeah. to pizza night on Fridays. <laughs> pizza, pizza. I think we're all really hungry after yeah, that no list. Kidding. Some good ideas. <laughs> Veganuary. Might, might give it a shot. We have a couple weeks left. Why not? <laughs> All right, Tracy, thanks yeah. so much. All right. Thank you, Tracy. And our apologies well, to Tracy. We're about to make a very aggressive turn here. <laughs> Coming turn. up, a double, double dream that many have hoped for, and now it's becoming a reality. Yeah, so in and out is expanding <laughs> in the east. Will it be a city near you? We'll reveal its new location for you next. The 2023 Girl Scout cookie season has officially started, and this year they're bringing something new, a brand new cookie, Raspberry Rally, considered a sister cookie to the beloved Thin Mint. It's described as a thin and crispy cookie infused with raspberry flavor and then dipped in chocolate coating. It's the first in the Girl Scout cookie lineup to be offered exclusively online, so you can't buy them on sidewalks outside grocery stores right now, I guess, Kathy. Wow, that looks delicious. Yeah. I want to give it a shot. I know, I wanted to. Yeah, it's my favorite <laughs> time of year, Girl Scout season. I feel like
feel like I'm dressed like a Girl Scout today. <laughs> okay, you're ready to go. <laughs> yep. All right, Joe, thanks. Well, get ready, East Coast. A little piece of California gold is headed your way. In and Out is set to make its grand opening in Tennessee by 2026, bringing major competition to chicken shops across the state. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin takes a bite out of the story. Nothing says California cuisine quite like a thick, juicy burger from in and out An L.A. favorite of locals, tourists, even celebrities celebrating big wins. I love In-N-Out Burger. What began as the Golden State's first drive through hamburger stand, now making moves to Tennessee. Set to open its first Tennessee location by 2026. I'm very happy to... Um, <laughs> meet the customers here and uh, make their dreams come true and probably a few other states a little upset so <laughs> and an east coast in and out was once a fantasy of the late anthony bourdain every once in a while somebody starts some cool person starts a rumor everybody in new york goes like goes insane oh my god oh my god in and out is coming when in and out opened in colorado people waited in line for 12 hours to get that double double with fries but can the SoCal staple flourish in a state known for its fiery fried chicken? For almost 75 years, Angelinos have driven through locations like this one. Now it's Tennessee's turn. In and out says it could expand even further. And the question for everyone craving all of this, how close and how soon? Erin McLaughlin, NBC News, Los Angeles. Now I'm really hungry. Yeah, all me right. too. <laughs> that does it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.